greeting students. Now, today we are going to be looking at uh, evidence one. And uh, I think you can remember that where we stopped off was at the class of witnesses. Okay, so that is what we're going to be looking at. And I hope that you are fine as we kick off. But before we start, I want us to be able to recap. The last lesson that we had was on burden of proof. And you remember when we're talking about evidence one, it is foundational causes. We are looking at the foundational units. So the first thing which you must be able to remind yourself with regards to witnesses, why should we be able to study witnesses when it comes to evidence one? Because when it comes to the production of evidence, you will need a tool. You will need the, the, the way in which to be able to produce that particular evidence. And the most common form is usually witnesses. Because remember, in our, I think, first or second class, we talked about the issue of oral evidence, oral testimony. So when it comes to the issue of witnesses, we must be able to study it in depth. Now, it is important, of course, to understand who is a witness. A witness is simple. Somebody who just gives evidence, comes to court and gives evidence. And of course, you must keep in mind that when you go to court, every witness who takes the stand must either be sworn or affirmed. In the next slide, you're going to be able to see the difference between sworn, meaning taking an oath, or affirmation. Why does a witness need to be sworn or affirmed? Simple. In case they actually give false testimony under evidence, then of course we have a situation where we can be able to actually charge them for perjury. So that is why every witness, there are only two types of witnesses that you're going to learn in this class who do not need to be sworn or affirmed. Every other witness who takes the stand must take an oath or be affirmed. Now, it is also important that in this class, we're also going to learn about people who we call competent witnesses vis-a-vis -vis compelable witnesses. What do those terms mean? Generally, every witness who takes the stand must be competent, every witness, but not every witness who is competent is compelable. And we're going to be able to look at those terms, this particular class, and, uh, you know, uh, understand even further what it means now. As I said, every witness must either take an oath or an affirmation. Now, you can be able to see that those particular uh, two types of definitions that I've given, the Oaths and Statutory Declarations Act, Section uh, Cap 15, Section 14 talks about an oath, Section 15 talks about an affirmation. An oath is when somebody lifts the Bible or the Quran or the Gita and they swear that they are going to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. However, there are people who do not believe in God. So what do you do? If you have those kinds of people, then you actually affirm. You can be able to see there either that he has no religious belief or that the taking of an oath is contrary to his religious beliefs. There are some religions who do not believe in swearing, so they will be affirmed. But generally, every witness must first either take an oath or be affirmed. Are we together? So on that issue, number one. Then the second thing which every court then must be able to satisfy itself is this. Is the witness competent? Now, when we go to competency, we are simply talking about section 125. Just section 125 only. Just keep that in mind at the back of your mind, section 125. And it simply defines, all persons shall be competent to testify. All, everybody, kila mtu, is competent to testify. Unless the court considers they are prevented from understanding the questions put to them or from giving rational answers to those questions. Now, what does that mean? Generally, this is the definition of a competent witness. You can understand the question. You can give a rational answer. Now, please note this. A rational answer does not mean a correct answer. For example, if I ask today, if, if my question to my witness today is, what is the color of the, what is it called, the shawl that I'm wearing today? And they actually say red. Now, they have understood the question. They have not given a correct answer, but it is a rational answer because they understand the question I've asked is color. So it doesn't have to be a correct answer. If, for example, I again ask the same question, what is the color of this shawl? And then somebody says chips. There's a problem there. That is not a rational answer. That is not a competent witness. Understand the question, give rational answers. That is all a competent witness is. That is all. That is all. Now here, section 125, you are warned that generally all witnesses will be competent unless 
the court believes that they cannot understand the question or give rational answers. Why? Because of tender years, so we are going to be able to look at child witnesses, extreme old age, disease, whether of body or mind, or any similar cause. So let us be able to unpackage these categories of witnesses, special types of witnesses. Let's start, of course, with children. Because remember, they have stated the issue of tender years. It is important for us to understand that when it comes to children, children are witnesses. Children testify all the time. So what happens when you have a child witness? The first thing you must be able to understand is that when it comes to a child as a witness, competency is more about their understanding. Because remember, they must be able to understand and give rational answers. So it's more about their maturity. Now, which type of children are we talking about? They have talked about tender years. Tender years has been defined in the Children's Act as a child who is below the age of 10. But please note, in practice, it is below the age of 14. So anytime you have a child who is about to testify, and when you look at them, you can be able to gauge that they're below the age of 14. Ideally, their competency must first be examined. And how is it examined? It is done through something we call voir dire. So the magistrate or the judge will have a conversation with that particular child. And in that conversation, all they are going to be doing is trying to prove their competency. Number one, do you understand the questions I put to you? Number two, do you understand? Can you be able to give me rational answers? And number three, are you able to understand the nature of an oath? That is what voir dire is. It must be conducted in the presence of an accused person if it is a criminal case. Let's unpackage it further. Section 19.1 of the Oaths and Statutory Declarations Act. Voir dire is an examination that serves two purposes. Number one, competency of the witness. Two, to find out if the witness understands that. If the court is to say you can be sworn or affirmed, do you understand what the implication is? That if you tell a lie, we can actually be able to bring criminal proceedings against you for perjury. So when it comes to children, it is important to note that when it comes to children, if, for example, you're the magistrate in that particular court, you're going to be having a conversation, but that conversation must be recorded so that the high court has stated over and over again that when it is an issue of voir dire, you must be able to look at the proceedings and see the question that was put. Now, this is the type of question. For example, unaituaje, ukona miaka ngapi, unakaa wapi, mami anaituaje, shule yako inaituaje. Those are the types of questions to be able to just get the first basis, competency. Do they understand? Can they give rational answers? Remember again, rational answers, not always correct answers, but rational answers. The second one is they must also be able to ask questions to find out, do you understand that if I decide to have the oath administered on you, what the oath means to you? So among children, the magistrate or the judge must go a step further and ask questions with regard to do they understand what an oath is. They must be able to. So it goes deeper. Questions of perhaps, unaenda kanisa gani? Ukiwa kanisa, munafundishwa kusema ukweli. Na sasa, ukiwa hapa, unaelewa ya kuwa lazima useme ukweli. Na usiposema ukweli Unajua ni nini kita tokea, ama ni nini kita fanyika. Those are the types of questions that need to be asked. Now, there's no handbook, there's no manual for voir dire. There's none. And it differs. So that what happens is that there's usually a lot of challenge when it comes to voir dire with regards to the younger children. And that is why you're going to find that with most young children, most of the times in the end, if the court finds they are competent to testify, they might find they cannot be sworn. So that a child is one of two witnesses who is allowed to give unsworn evidence. If at the end of conducting your examination as the magistrate or the judge, you, want, you say, okay, fine, this child looks sensible enough, they understand the questions, they can give rational answers. But in my opinion, I cannot be able to make them take an oath. They still do not understand what the meaning of an oath is. Then, a child can be able to give unsworn testimony. What is the effect of unsworn testimony? Generally, when it comes to a child's testimony, 
when it is given and it is unsworn, it must be corroborated. Now, corroboration is just a fancy word you're going to learn in your evidence too, which means that evidence which must be supplemented, which must be strengthened. You must have something in addition to the testimony of the person. So that we're saying when a child stands in court and gives unsworn testimony, then that is, that is evidence that is unsworn. It ought to be corroborated. That is your section 124. The only exception, again, under section 124 is in sexual offenses. And if you read your section 124, you're going to be able to see it very clearly. When you read this section, it says, notwithstanding the provisions of section 19 of the Oaths and Statutory Declarations Act, where the evidence of an alleged victim, that is the child, admitted in accordance with that section on behalf of the prosecution in proceedings against any person of an offense, the accused shall not be liable to be convicted. So meaning that if a child gives unsworn evidence, then there can be no conviction. It needs to be corroborated, except in sexual offenses. So if, if the child is a victim of a sexual offense, and they are the only witness, and what happened is that they actually gave unsworn evidence, there can still be a conviction as long as the court satisfies itself that the child was telling the truth. Are we together on that? So it is very, very important to be able to remember that particular exception. Remember what we said about evidence. Evidence is all about rules. And we must always know exceptions to the rules. Right? Fine. Now, again, I'm simply highlighting the same thing. Unsworn evidence. Permit the admission of evidence of a child not on oath. So please note that a child can be able to give evidence that is not on oath. When it comes to extremely old witnesses, you remember... Section 124 has told us about extremely old witnesses. So now, what happens if, for example, you have a client who is 90 or 80s and is actually senile, what we call dementia? Now, for that, we really do not have a, what is it called a rule or a way of procedure. What we usually try to do is that under the civil procedure rules, we usually try to make an application called de bene esse. And in Dibene Ese, it simply means this. You move the court and you tell the court, my client, for these reasons, needs to have their evidence taken immediately. I have filed a case today. I need the evidence taken within a month. Why? Because she is 90. He is 85. They are suffering from dementia. I'm not sure that they are going to wait the two, three years for a full trial. Because remember, you're the one who is going to have a difficult time when you put your client on the stand your elderly client, and you're asking questions, and your client cannot be able to give rational answers, or even doesn't hear, because there are those instances. So you're the one who has to be on point to understand, I need to be able to move fast. So we usually use a ruling procedure. Sometimes a court can decide to conduct voir dire, but be aware. Elderly witnesses can be very cantankerous when you're actually asking an elderly witness, he ni rangigani. Uh, they might find like a if you're insulting the intelligence. So just be aware. So that's why I say it is better to actually make an application for Dibene Ese. That would be better. It also maintains their dignity. The earlier you get their testimony, the better. Mentally ill. What happens if, for example, you have somebody who is mentally ill? Is a person who suffers from mental illness a competent witness? Can they understand the questions? Can they give rational answers? That's all. And Section 125.2 has stated, a mentally disordered person or a lunatic, in fact, they've used the word lunatic, is not incompetent to testify. So they've not shut them out. They have not shut out mentally incompetent patients. They haven't. Unless he's prevented by his condition from understanding the questions put to him and giving rational answers. Why? We cannot lump all people with mental illnesses together. Schizophrenia is a mental illness. If you take medicine, you can manage it. Bipolar is a mental illness. When it comes to maniac depressives, when it comes to Down syndrome, when it comes to autism, when it comes to Asperger's, they are totally different. And also somebody might have cerebral palsy. So they are usually different grades or ranges. So you cannot lump them all together. 
So again, you must be able to look at this particular patient dealing with this particular mental illness and then say, for this particular person, they cannot be competent to testify. They are not able to move, they are not able to speak, they are clearly incompetent. But if it is somebody who just has mental illness that can be managed by medication, then they are a competent witness. So please note that. Accomplices. Now, you know who an accomplice is. An accomplice is a person who has been charged together with a co-accused for having allegedly committed a crime. Okay? Accused number two or three or four. Now, what happens when that particular accomplice wants to testify against the other? What happens? Because the issue has become, why should I actually believe them? But the law is clear that an accomplice is actually a competent witness. Section 141, an accomplice shall be a competent witness against an accused person. So accused number two or three can be able to jump ship, get a plea agreement, go to the other side and testify against their co-accused persons. And in fact, they go on to state that a conviction shall not be illegal merely because it proceeds upon the uncorroborated evidence of an accomplice. They don't even need to corroborate the evidence according to section 141. The only thing which the court does is to warn itself of taking that particular type of evidence. Why do they warn themselves? Because they know that most of the times there is no honor among thieves. Accused one who has decided to go to the other side is probably trying to save their neck. All you can do when it comes to accomplice evidence is to remember your section 57 to C. When it comes to character evidence and be able to attack an accomplice on the stand with regards to their character. But please note, an accomplice is a competent witness against their fellow accused person. What about these people who we call diplomats? What happens? A diplomat, a person who is, who is uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, what is it called? Has some special status in this country with regards to maybe he's a foreign sovereign. Are they competent? They are competent. Why? I'm sure they can understand questions put to them and they can give rational answers. They are very competent questions, uh, very, very competent witnesses. We're not going to have a problem with that. The issue is if they are competent, because what happens is that you have written a statement. Now, on the day of court, the witness says, I am not going to come to court to testify. What happens? Ideally, and generally, any witness who records a statement and does not come to court to testify can be compelled. They will be compelled. They will be arrested. They will be told you must testify. That is what is called compelability of a witness. You will testify. So when it comes to foreign sovereigns and diplomats, there are laws that protect them with regards to compelability, not competency. They are competent, but they are not compelable. The Privileges and Diplomatic Immunities Act, which we have obviously uh, adopted, the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, Article 31, Rule 2, a diplomatic agent is not obliged to give evidence as a witness. They are competent, they are not compelable. If they feel like, yes. If they don't, you cannot compel them. So that's why I said you must be aware of those two particular words. Competency is for everyone. Compelability is not for everyone. Other types of uh, persons who may not be compelable, president. Is he a competent witness? Absolutely. Is he compelable? No. Why? Remember the Constitution and with regards to his immunity. But we're not even interested about his immunity because at that point, that section talks about his Im Im immunity of criminal proceedings against him. But at this point, you just want him to be a witness. But remember what I told you. If a witness cannot come to court to testify, then they'll be compelled by way of arrest. Can you arrest the president? No. And therefore, he's not compelable. Okay? Competent? Absolutely. Competent, uh, compelable? Absolutely not. Bankers, for those of you who are going to enter the corporate world, who are going to be dealing with compliance, you're the company secretaries in these banks, it's important for you to understand that Section 140 has protected banks. 
when it comes to the books of a bank or even a banker testifying, there is an issue where they cannot be compelled. We call it a level of privilege. A bank or an officer of a bank shall not in any legal proceedings to which the bank is not a party be compelled to produce any banker's books. Subsection 2 goes on to even add, no bank or officer of a bank shall be summoned or called as a witness to prove any matters except by an order of a judge or a magistrate made for special cause. And you know why, isn't it? When it comes to banks, they have a very special duty when it comes to fiduciary and the issue of confidentiality. So that when it comes to the issue of testifying in court, unless they're a party to that particular suit, you cannot tell them to bring in evidence. And also, unless they actually get an order from a judge or a magistrate, they cannot be compelled to come to court to testify. Please note that. The other category of witnesses, spouses. Spouses. Now, Section 127, civil proceedings, it's very direct. In civil proceedings, the party to the suit and the husband or wife of any party to the suit shall be competent witnesses. No problem. So in civil proceedings, it's clear. In criminal proceedings, subsection 2, every person charged with an offense and the wife or husband of the person charged shall be a competent witness for the defense. So here they're basically telling us this. In criminal proceedings, you cannot compel a spouse to testify against the other. They can testify for each other, okay? But they cannot testify against each other. It is clear. The rationale, a spouse shall not testify against their partner in order to keep the, preserve the peace of families. So it is clear. Spouses, not compelable not compelable in criminal proceedings. What is the exception? Section 127.3. Exceptions. The rule is that a spouse is not compelable. What is the exception? In criminal proceedings, the wife or husband of the person charged shall be a competent and compelable witness for the prosecution or defense without the consent of such person, without the consent of the accused person, in these three instances, three exceptions, where a spouse will be compelled to testify against their spouse. Number one, if the accused has been charged with the offense of bigamy, you know what bigamy is, isn't it? Bigamy is where you have contracted a monogamous marriage, meaning it is either Christian, civil, or Hindu, where the law states that you can only have one spouse, right? And then your spouse decides, Sijato Sheka, and decides to go ahead and enter into other marriages. That is what bigamy is. In that particular case, a spouse shall be compelled to testify against the other spouse. Number two, if the spouse has been charged with an offense under the Sexual Offenses Act, it doesn't even categorize what type of offense. Any offense under the Sexual Offenses Act, the spouse will be compelled to testify against them. The rationale for this, I guess, was uh, uh, crimes, for example, like incest. So for that one, competent and compelable. The last one, C, in respect of an act or omission affecting the person or property of the wife or husband of such person or the children of either of them and not otherwise. Let me break this down. Act or omission affecting the person of the wife or husband. For example, if there's going to be an issue of domestic violence, the husband assaults the wife, or vice versa. That act or omission has affected the person, the person. So then that particular spouse will be compelled to testify against the other. Property. If perhaps after that particular domestic violence, the one who was beaten decides that I will get back at you. So I'm going to pack all your clothes, your laptop, pack them in your vehicle and set it on fire. Property, isn't it? If there is an issue of property, damage of property against one spouse, then the other spouse will be a competent and compelable witness against them in court. Children, if anything should go wrong with the children, if, for example, one particular spouse is accused of having murdered the other, a child, sorry, one of their child, then 
the spouse will be compelled to actually testify against the other spouse. Please note those particular three exceptions. And please note that it ends with this line, and not otherwise. So those exceptions are very, very narrow when it comes to spouses being compelled to testify against each other. It is important for you to remember the case of Republic versus Amkeo. You remember this case happened even before we were a colony in 1917. You remember it was a case of a, a man who was arrested. He was charged with handling stolen property. The wife was compelled to testify against him. The judge then stated that there's nothing like wives when it comes to Africans. There's nothing like wives. They just have something we call wife purchase. And that is why the Evidence Act was actually amended. If you look at that section 127, you see that they actually state that marriages, marriages actually also include marriages under native or tribal customs. So please note that even in polygamous marriages, there is going to be the issue of you cannot compel a spouse to testify against the other unless those three exceptions. Former spouses, ex, your ex, what do you do? Please note that the rule here is in this particular case, Monroe versus Twistleton. And it is simple. A spouse will not be able to testify as to anything that happened during the tenure of the marriage. It's your ex. For, 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 most likely, by the way, by the time you actually went your separate ways, there was a lot of bile and anger. And so, of course, that particular person may be coming back to set you up. So the law is very clear. What happened during the marriage, you cannot say anything. It is also covered by something that we call privilege. However, an ex-spouse can be able to testify and is compelable to testify as to anything which arose after the divorce in the same way as any other witness. But what happened during, during the subsistence of the marriage? Absolutely not. Because that is protected by what we call spousal privilege. Are we together? Yes? So now, as we are wrapping up this issue of witnesses, it is important for you to, uh, you know, ask yourself for those issues of those special witnesses. These are the re this is the reading that I want you to be able to take on because you must be able to actually read this and uh, be able to actually read more with regards to the cases available and the issue of witnesses. Now, that was our class for today. And I hope that uh, if there are any questions, of course, I can always be found uh, online to be able to respond to them. Okay? And um, all I'll try to tell you is uh, stay safe. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for listening to me. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then, email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.